John and Justin Diener of Five Points, California in the San Joaquin Valley and Scott Park of Meridian, California in the Sacramento Valley are organic processing tomato farmers. Over the past 40 years or so, they have developed and refined their practices into the highly successful production systems that they have now. I'm John Diener and I farm in Five Points, California and I am the owner of uh, Red Rock Ranch Incorporated. We're harvesting, uh, processing tomatoes here for an organic pack. So I'm here to make sure that this machine that you see in the background here harvesting these tomatoes uh, does a good job. And a good job is something in the order of getting all of the red tomatoes off the ground, sorting the green ones out with electronic eyes that ride on the machine, and uh, make sure that we uh, go at a proper speed to make the load count that the cannery wants today. They have to have so many tons an hour to run the cannery and so we're part of a group of farmers delivering to the cannery today and so I have to put out in this case 25 truckloads of tomatoes in a 12-hour period. Processing tomatoes in California is a, a large vegetable crop, maybe not the largest, but in volume it probably is the largest. We produce in the processing tomato world about a third of the world's production of processing tomatoes. In Fresno County, which is where we are because of the soils and um, the uh, temperatures, this produces right at about 35% of all the tonnage of tomatoes for the California processing tomato companies. In our case, we're right at the very front of the season for the tomato harvest. So once we get out of the way, conventional tomatoes will be going to the cannery and um, they have the ability to put on fungicides and different products to help them in the September and the first part of October period. I've been growing organic tomatoes since 1989 and our yields are as good as, if not better than. The quality of the tomatoes, uh, the appearance, internal characteristics all have to meet or exceed the standards that are set for conventional tomatoes. Otherwise, we would not get acceptance in the marketplace for our commodity. Uh, we're very happy with the yields that we're making this year. And the reason we have such great yields this year on our organic tomatoes is just because we've somewhat mastered the technique of irrigation. One of the things that we do to help our production of organic tomatoes is the kind of fertility program that we have. We use uh, compost that comes from uh, uh, steer uh, manure uh, additive and going through. We use a poultry compost. We have to use different composts to do our production because the available of the availability of the supply of the individual type of compost may not be there at any one time when we need to treat the field. We use about a ton of gypsum per acre. We apply that gypsum with the compost, uh, incorporate that into the bed, and then uh, produce the tomatoes that may be derived from fish. They also are derived from algae. We do certain uh, products that have been fermented. We see responses. You have to have the base fertility there, but once you have that, then these other products enhance the microbiological activity. Some of the things to know is how over time, through the research that the university has done here at our local field station, as well as at Davis, um, the architecture of the plant has changed. We used to have a single row of tomatoes on a 60-inch bed, right down the center. Today we have an 80-inch bed, so it's 20 inches wider. Now we put two rows on top of the bed. We space them out a little further down their individual row, and then the tape is in the middle. And from that, we have the ability to uh, maximize what, in essence, is the framework of the plant. So our marketing plan for our tomatoes is to have a reputation, to be the best. People know who we are, we've been around a while, and from that we acquire contracts. There are nine million acres of agriculture in California active. 
And so you have to set yourself apart as being someone that has the ability to deliver the quantity, the quality, and the type of tomatoes that the people have at a certain time. Because of that, you have a working relationship with two or three canneries. So when it comes to harvest, like today, as you see out here, they are running and we have to know how many acres we're doing and how many we got ahead of us. So yesterday, I sold the excess tonnage that we had to a third cannery. And the guy says, we're gonna take these because there's others in the area that wanna sell us the tomatoes, but I like yours the best. We're in a commodity business, so the fungibility of the product made from our tomatoes is interchangeable with whoever. In California, we have an agreement amongst the growers and the processors. There are approximately a thousand farmers in California that do grant cannery tomatoes, but we have a thing called PTAB. That's the California Department of Food and Agriculture's arm for inspection, and it's a neutral third party that looks at the tomatoes, inspects them, and gives a grade and quality for each truckload that goes through the cannery. All of our tomatoes go in at a set price. We know ahead of time how much we're gonna get paid a ton. We don't know how many tons we're gonna to make, but our goal obviously is to meet or exceed our contract. I grew up here in an adjacent farm with my father, learned how to do things on a practical basis. I had a hands-on world that I lived in, but I wanted to learn the technical part, so I went to Davis. I started in 1980 farming here on the west side and then built my own farm. And now today we farm about 4,000 acres. I like agriculture, I like open agriculture. I like uh, fetched crops, tree crops, those things you can farm them, take a day off, come back, keep working. You develop a system to what you do. So you can see here, we have a, a tractor with a set of doubles that have these tubs on them and we're uh, getting ready. Here comes the combine down the uh, road here. He's gonna turn in here and we're harvesting this field of tomatoes. Currently, we're averaging something in the realm of about 60 tons of tomatoes per acre here. We're harvesting here and we have a shredder on the machine that actually takes the tomato vines. You see how green it is over there and uh, how fine it is and it leaves it at dry mulch on top of the bed. That dry mulch, is going to dry out. We're going to incorporate it. We're probably having in this particular field about seven or eight tons of dry material that we are incorporating because we're taking about 60 tons of tomatoes off of this field. We have buried drip right here in the middle of this bed and we want to keep these rows exactly where they are and we do that with GPS keep the rows in the same place, but the compaction that comes from those large tires of the truck, because we're hauling about 80,000 pounds on those trailers down through the field, and that really compacts your soil. So we have to do something to loosen that up and get that so that the roots can have a full area to penetrate at the end of the day and maintain a bed that we can come back and harvest next year. We talked about the architecture of the plant. You have to build the frame of the plant in the field to put the fruit on. You have to have the larger beds to accept that type of framework of plant. Think of the tractor similarly. This tractor has a new type of architecture to it, okay? What's unique about this tractor compared to other tractors and tractors that are out on the market that you may have seen in the field before, because this is a relatively new model and a relatively new technique. So if you look on the top of the tractor up there, there's a little white dome. That little white dome on the top is a GPS, so it's connected to satellite. That's what keeps us straight in the world. Inside the cab, you don't, can't see it very well from here, but there's a screen up there. And the man can dial in what we call the AB lines, 
and get themselves squared up with the row. Once we set it for the field, the tractor will drive itself through the field. Only thing the man has to do is turn itself around in reality. With this day and age technology for driverless cars, the tractor actually could turn itself around. We haven't elected to do that for safety reasons and other things. We still have a driver and he does the turning around. But he also watches to make sure that the signal doesn't quit. So every once in a while the signal quits and so all of a sudden we're out of work for a minute until the signal comes back up from the satellite. So those are those little common things that happen every day. But what's unique about this tractor? This looks kind of like a funny tractor. It's got tracks on the back and wheels on the front. So if you're, in this case, Case, IH, which is the company that builds this tractor, you say, okay, how am I going to adapt the new technology, the GPS, to the vehicles we have? You may have seen tractors with treads. So the treads are the whole mechanism for the tractor. That has some issues because when you're going with GPS down the row, if you move the tracks one side to the other, you move the back end or the implement in the opposite direction. And so you can't keep the implement steady on where you're going with the GPS because what I was telling you, everything is about keeping those beds where that tape is and not ruining our tape because the tape is about a $200 an acre investment. And we don't want to get it off because we want to put new plants there next year that put their roots down where the tape is easily. So all that being said, they came and said, okay, we're gonna boot the tracks only on the back. We're gonna achieve the contact with the soil, the compaction issue, the traction issue, all those things that you achieve in having tracks. This is a big enough frame of a tractor to do that. But then what they did is they said, okay, we're going to put tires on the front. So if you have what they call an articulated tractor, those are the large tractors with big horsepower that bend in the middle, okay? They have the same problem that the tread, it's not quite as bad as, more, it's actually worse than the ones with treads, but still again, when you move the front tires to the left, the rear end goes to the right. It doesn't work. It's hard for them to do the compensation with the computer and the GPS to keep the rows aligned, and that's why articulating tractors are not being used. But this tractor has front wheels. All they have to do is move. They pivot on the axle, not on the frame. And so if you need to move an inch or two, then the computer can say, hey, you need to move over an inch. The front tires move a little bit, but the treads on the back are positive traction so they continue to go in the same direction all the time and the rear end doesn't move. It's only the front that moves. The directionally when you're going through the field you're only going to be moving one or two inches one or the other because you hit a hard spot the implement moves the tractor a little bit but ultimately at the end of the day you got to keep that tractor in that line and that's what the computer does all day long. So we're going to walk around that's the tractor component. You have to have a lot of horsepower. This has 340 horsepower. We're gonna walk around and look at the implement that it's pulling. So this piece, this equipment, if you remember, we looked at the back end of that harvester and there was that green material on the top of the ground. That was all the tomato vines. Not all the time do they come out nice and shredded like this. Sometimes they're stringy, all kinds of different conditions. What this does, these are called coulters. These are actually like a disc that goes straight. These are called a wavy coulter because they're wavy. And what they are, they're very sharp. They're like a knife and they roll forward. And what they do is they cut any stringy material into something that's about four inches, which is about this distance. Why? Why do we want that? We'll come around back and we'll look at the rest. So from the front, we saw those wavy coulters. They're out in front of these shanks. What they do is they cut the material so that they don't build up. If you didn't cut it, It'd be like a rope and it would lay around that shank. Same thing there. This shank here is in the middle of the bed. Our rows of tomatoes are 12 inches apart. This is 24 inches. So what we're doing here is knifing the top of the bed and cutting any roots or anything that may be there and flipping it out. Mental disturbance because about six inches below the point of this shank right here is our tape and we cannot get close to that and it's soft and it's wet and there's no problem there for where we're at but we have to use this 
to open it up, get the top of the bed correct, and get it ready for next season. Over here we have a shank. Now this is on the shoulder of the bed, and this is where those tires, when you look down the row and saw the tire marks from that heavy truck, they're compacting what we call the shoulder of the bed towards the furrow, but right here on the shoulder. We need to fluff that back up. We need a square bed to put the tomatoes on next year. To do that, we have to shank, and this goes down 15 inches in the ground and breaks that hard area where the tires run. This shank here runs in the furrow. This shank goes in the ground about 24 inches. And what this does is it breaks the bottom of the furrow where the most compaction from the tires the trucks and any wheel implements that we've used during the year cultivating or planting or whatever. We work it when it's a little wet, we get compaction. So this breaks the compaction, shatters the soil right now behind the harvest. Because when you do that, it makes large clods. We have this unit here that rolls over those clods. It's quite heavy. And what it does is it breaks the clods into four inch pieces. In doing that in one pass, we have the land tillage done for next year. And all we have to do is row work behind that to shape the bed square and even and get it ready for the winter when the rains come and um, work forward. So this works both in the conventional system, works in the organic system, but this is a minimum uh, least amount of tillage activity. You got a high horsepower tractor that goes through and conditions the soil for next year with the GPS going in the right direction. And so we maintain our beds, maintain our tape, and then the next year we come back. So this is the least investment of fuel per acre. When you look at all the passes you would have to do to do what this one piece of equipment does. Over at the other field, we were just looking at the Wilcox in furrow ripping system to reestablish the beds with the GPS. Now we have the beds established where they were last year because of the GPS. So when we looked at that, I was telling you those big crumbler wheels on the back of the machine were there to break that dirt that the chisel shanks ripped up. If you look right here, you can see where the ripper shank went right through here and it made these clods. These clods are unacceptable to make a new row for next year. We have to do something that is cost effective to crumble these things while they're dry. If they get wet, they get muddy, this ground has a lot of clay in it, it'll get sticky and make even worse problems for us as a, from an agronomic as well as a practical sense. These here are ring rollers. These are points that are made with cast iron. These are very heavy. And we run with some speed and have a tractor pulling this. This is an inexpensive process to get the soil broken down from these clods to something that we can work with. In this furrow right here, how we've broken the clods. So you look at this furrow right here and then walk across the bed to this furrow right here and look at the clottiness. This is an inexpensive way, not only of firming up and compacting the ground, but it also breaks a lot of the clods. We may elect to do this two times because we have broken probably 80%. We may want to break a little more to find the dirt up so we can remake our beds for the tomatoes next year. The other piece that I wanted to show you is what the Wilcox unit did on top of the bed. So if you look down the top of the bed, you can see the trash that we had on top of the bed from the tomatoes. It's dried up right now. So what we've done is we took that flat shovel and cut the center and went in the ground about six, eight inches. In that process, we made the top of this ground very soft. This is where the new roots of the new crop are gonna to have to go. So we don't want any compaction here. 
If you get down and look, you can find the tape down here in the ground. This is where the water comes up to the roots that are right here. This is 12 inches apart on the center. This is where the new plant's going. It's all soft. And we made this very friable in one process. What we're going to do next here is take, if you look down, there's a bit of a V to the bed. We're going to flatten this out. But what we want to do is we want to take all this residue and incorporate it in the top of the bed. This is the mulch that we are looking for. It includes roots from the tomato plant, as well as some tomatoes, but all the stems. So this is all the plant material getting reincorporated in the soil. We want this uniform because then it becomes part of the humus within the soil. If you look here in this bed right here, but I can show you the gypsum. There's still some residual gypsum from last year here. There's also some of the compost. You can see how the root hair has penetrated this piece of compost. And so it's a slow degradation process. Not all the compost is available the year you apply it. So you can see right here, it's some more hair roots, more compost. It becomes part of the area where the roots want to grow. It's a relationship of the biological functions that go in and degrading that and the roots themselves living in a symbiotic matter with all the fungus and bacteria that live in relationship to those root hairs in the top. Again, this is an organic field like the other one we were looking at. And we did very well here. So th th this is kind of our process for reconstructing the beds for next year. Been talking about composting, been talking about doing green manure crops as cover crops to help the soil. In our region, we have a hard time with the water and so we don't have the kind of water you need to have to drive a green cover crop. So what we've done is we've added material. So there's different ways of getting carbon. So if you can see here in the soil, this has got a fair amount of compost mixed in with the soil. So this is like trying to create a raised bed garden if you want a better term. But you can see right here, here's the soil. Here's the compost, it's down here. Okay, so we're gonna dig a little bit here. And what we're gonna find is there's some compost, but I'm looking for the white roots of the plant. There's a root that's penetrating through into the area where we have the compost. After a minute, this plant will have a proliferation. You can see there's another white root exposed right there. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's running in the soil. You can see the tangential um, feeder roots coming out, running in the soil. You can see that all kind of going after the area that we, here's a root I'm exposing from this tomato plant that is at least you can see all the small feeder roots coming off of the side of it. It looks like a robust plant. It's already moving. It's starting to form little flower things. These are how old Justin? These these plants are probably these planted probably the, <clears throat> the 7th of March. Uh-huh. About the 7th of March. So March. these are uh, this is a good example of what the composting can do. These plants, looking down the row, are as big as any plants planted at this time in the region, in the same environment, under an organic, high-level composting program with gypsum and things that balance the soil. And I think it's pretty obvious from the observation here that you can see that we have healthy plants. I'm Justin Diener and we're located in Five Points, California, which is in uh, the San Joaquin Valley of California. Um, it's a large agricultural region. 
and we produce um, a vast majority of the processing tomatoes in the U.S. The tomato processing industry over the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years has gone from direct seeded um, planting to transplants in vast majority, in part because the, the, um, the cost of the seed has grown um, significantly. And the seed is basically, um, I believe it's produced in a hand-pollinated um, setting, I think in East Asian countries, and it's still, it's very costly. Um, on a per acre basis, it's about $250 an acre for the seed. It's probably about another $200 to $250 an acre for the transplants and a similar amount for the actual mechanical process of transplanting the plants. Um, right now, we're, we plant about 8,700 plants per acre, which is um, probably on the 90th percentile for being high in terms of the amount of plants per acre people plant. There are people plant 5,500 to 6,000 plants per acre, but um, we've had issues in the past with um, virus and plant loss, frost, other things, and we feel that um, the best chance for establishing a, a crop that has potential to get the full yield that we need is to have a higher plant population. Uh, we farm all organically, so um, we don't have some of the tools that the conventional farmers who plant less per acre are able to use. This field has been planted for almost, probably three, three and a half to four weeks. It's been in the ground. This was the first um, section of tomatoes that we planted. Um, typically after we plant, we irrigate with um, the underground drip, that, which this field has, and we probably put about 96 hours all on the field of um, irrigation. And on an in inch basis, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head what that is equivalent to, but basically the uh, drip tubing is about 12 inches underground, and we try to get the, the moisture from the drip tube to kind of rise up to that little plug that we've planted in the field. And we try to use, um, they're about three different uh, sizes, or basically tray counts of um, transplants that you can get from the nursery. Um, this past year we've gone to 338s, which is 338 plants per tray. A lot of people plant um, based on 450s, which is a smaller plug, but we feel that, that gives us a healthier, larger plant to get started. And so now um, we're in the process of cultivating this field, trying to eliminate a lot of the weeds. One of our, the challenges in our production system is morning glory. And so we plan to cultivate and probably once or twice, once every one to two weeks, we're going to run through the field and undercut the shoulders of the beds to knock back any weeds. Plus we're going to, um, in a maybe week or two, we'll come through with a weeding crew and um, try to remove some of the, uh, the weeds that are in the uh, actual plant line. At this site, we have about 1,200 acres. We have two wells that we, um, drive the majority of our irrigation water from. They're about, each one's about 1,400 feet deep, and they draw from the underground aquifer between about 900 and the 1,400 foot depth. The water is then lifted about between 400 to 500 feet to the surface. Once it's lifted the surface, it is then um, pressurized and run through sand media filters. Um, we use sand media filters because they're more versatile and robust than some other filtration systems. When we have surface water from our water district that we can use here, um, sand media filters are good about taking out the algae and other um, stuff that we have to get out of the water to be able to use in our um, drip irrigation system. Um, once the water goes through the filtration system, it's distributed through um, underground pipelines to the fields and in the case of the tomato field, it goes into the underground drip system where we treat it with a, um, a disinfectant to um, kind of keep the uh, drip systems functioning. With the organic system, and I think UC did research maybe five, ten years ago or longer, that basically showed a somewhat linear relationship between the amount of um, compost manure that you apply and um, your, your ultimate yield. And that's our primary fertilizer. Basically in the fall we bring in both chicken manure and um, steer compost. We, um, these are 80-inch beds. We open them up and have basically 40-inch beds. And down the center, we um, basically drop a band of um, compost. And so then the vast majority of the fertilizer, because we're organic, comes from that fertilizer that we apply in the fall.
and then we'll do some organic um, treatments in the through the irrigation system. But that's not providing very much of the overall nutrient um, budget. My name's Scott Park, um, and I'm farming in Meridian, which is about 50 miles north of Sacramento. Uh, the, we farm along the Sacramento River. I, I farm uh, 1,700 acres of certified organic ground. We grow up to 50 different crops, but our main concentration of crops is the tomatoes, wheat, rice, beans, corn, vine seed, which is like cucumber, squash, cantaloupe, and, uh, and we grow uh, a large amount of cover crops, and we also grow things like peas. Um, and a lot of this, all the different crops, is for one, to diversify risk, and two, that crop rotation is a critical part of our farming operation. So our goals is to, uh, for every year, for the ground to get better, without uh, mining either the resources of the soil or of our people. So, so, so we have a farm system that is designed to you know, hopefully create a good profit every year. The fields in the perimeter are better than they were the year before. And every year the livelihood of our employees is also better. So how do we do this? What's, what's the process? I, I've been growing tomatoes and other crops, but the base crop's been tomatoes. I'm starting my 45th year. Uh, for, for 15 years, I basically farmed 100% conventional. In, in 1985, 86, I started evolving to a more consciousness of taking care of the soil instead of just using outside external inputs to make the crop. Uh, as time's gone on, I've developed more and more appreciation for, for what the soil can do. Our, our eventual goal is to get to the health of the soil to such a point that our inputs are less and less. As it is now, with the diversity of crops we're growing, our inputs are, are basically compost, cover crops, all the crop residue of, of prior, the, the prior crops. And, uh, and then we use uh, microorganisms to keep the soil, say, jazzed up. And, uh, and we're also, we use seaweed and we use uh, gypsum. We we'll sort of use this field that we're in as an example of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So, so coming out of corn, well, first of all, ideally, I would like to do as little tillage as possible. But, but organically, it's pretty hard to have the weed control that we need. Um, so we do do tillage, but we tend to try and do as much as with what we're going to do in the fall. When it's a little drier, there's a little less activity of the uh, microbial life and of the earthworms. It, once in the spring, once the moisture's high, uh, and, and we've sort of, all the microbial life is sort of settled in, ready for a season of work, that's when we're more cautious and we tend to only try and work about three inches deep just to take care of the weeds. So again, so right now we've already added about four to five ton of, of corn straw into the ground. We, we've put in four ton of uh, a compost and then we're, we put in one ton of gypsum to, to the soil. Now we're planning, we've got this in, now we're planting a cover crop and it's a legume cover crop of vetch. And the reason that, that we're planting vetch, a, a mix of, of different, uh, you know, legume cereals would be excellent. However, this field might be getting planted the end of March, okay? So if you're gonna plant in the end, if you're gonna plant early in the spring, in the past we found that we've had problems with the cereal breaking down well and uh, the sort of the tensile strength, the, the fibers of it have caused us a lot of problem and it also has had a, a tendency to dry out the ground fast. If we, if we plant vetch, we can, we can chop it and, and actually and hit it with a, a tillage tool, a Lilliston, something like that, and, and it's dissipated. It's gone immediately and then we'll roll the ground down, let the moistures even out and then we'll come in and, and plant our crop. And, and like the, the, with the tomatoes, we can, 
say we're planting the tomatoes the end of March. So we would ideally sometime in early March, chop it and, and Lilliston in the cover crop. Roll it down, we would plant the tomatoes. The moisture is good enough that, and because of all our emphasis on building the soil up, our water usage is, the water retention is excellent, so our water usage is less. So we can plant the tomatoes, in the end of March, we can go 30 to 45 days without irrigating due to the healthy soil structure, the good root development, the retention of water, and the retentions of nutrients being available and not even have to till until maybe the middle of May. The, the advantage of that, particularly on the organic side, is that if you have to come in and irrigate right away, one, the, you know, maybe you're setting up the ground if you have to bring sprinklers in and it settles. But the other thing is now you just brought a wave of weeds up. Okay, so we don't want the wave of weeds. We want the top three inches relatively dry. So if we have the soil in such a healthy state that the roots grow well, the, the water is there, we can hold off. And so we just saved one, a lot of money on irrigating, on usage of water, using up water, and also saving on our first towing. And then we have to move into and we're irrigating actively probably once a week, once every eight days or so, depending on the weather, up until about 30 to 40 days before harvest. Now, a tomato crop covers about approximately 120 days. So we just cut out 30 to 40 days of water on the one end, and we can also cut out 30 to 40 days of water on the other end before harvest, working on the same principles why we could skip irrigating the start. The, the ground is a sponge from, from doing this now for 30 some years of, of, a, of a constant input of biomass in, in the various forms, uh, 10 to 15 tons of the 27 fields that we farm, every year we're putting 10 to 15 tons on depending on what the rotational crop, what the residue is from the past crop. So what this has done is it's just saving us our nitrogen usage is cut 30%. Our water usage has probably been cut 25 to 30%. Uh, to, to give you a comparison, we can go, so we're basically irrigating pretty hard for 60 days of a 120 day crop. And, and, and whereas most tomato growers are having to irrigate 90 to 100 to 110 days of that 120 day crop. So, and the reason we can do it is our roots, one, we're on good ground so we can do this, and two, and we're taking advantage of the good ground and good health, and the roots will go seven feet or more, whatever, whatever's needed for them to keep going. As the season goes on at the end of the season, the roots are actually drinking the profile, the moisture profile down. And, and, and you can probe at the end of the season and go six, seven feet, and not find any moisture, but then you hit beautiful moisture and you'll hit also beautiful roots. The, the other real advantage of this is quality, the, and, and which I don't think gets enough credit. And so by farming this way uh, of using more of the soil, our quality, we, our buyers, we don't lose buyers, we keep our buyers and in the intense environment of agriculture and of farmers in California competing for different markets, when the competition gets tight, it's who is the buyer gonna take care of? Are they gonna take care of the person that's providing high quality or the person that's just say, let's say sending them red water balls? So I've been growing tomatoes for 44 years. Uh, I've gone through a lot of hard times, but I found that that the best thing that I can do for the cannery is deliver quality and there's a nice reciprocal relationship. And, and I'm also, if, if the cannery can't get to me in time, the tomatoes hold up because they have the right balance inside the tomato. They don't collapse easy, they don't mold easy and, and what have you. Another example on quality of building up the soil and of it, of it being advantageous to the farmer and their bottom line is say is that we're also, we're growing right now rice without any inputs, nothing at all. We're growing it with cover crops only. We're getting yields as good as conventional and, and, and our quality is excellent. So the taking care of the soil, letting the soil do the work for you is we're finding continual benefits and in a sense a lot of serendipitous benefits that as we started into this, we had no idea exactly what we were getting into, but through time we have seen 
oh boy, we don't have to till as deep. We don't, we till faster, we use less fuel, we get more done in a day we, we, on, on our tillage end, so our fuel consumption goes down. And, and on every aspect of our business, there's a peripheral benefit that, that we didn't expect to get from taking care of the soil. So the, the driver for us is now, this time of the year, this is the fall, this is when we sort of set the plate for the spring and the summer. This is, if we got a till, this is when we do our tillage. This is when we're putting in the compost. This is when we're doing the cover crop. And then when the spring comes in, all the consideration is be light, be delicate, don't compact the soil, handle the soil with as much respect as possible, keep that microbial life and system as much intact as you can, and basically you just go from one crop to the mat. It doesn't matter which crop we're planting, whether it's basil, whether it's corn, whether it's tomatoes, whether it's, it's the vine seed, it, basically it's a scratch it, hold the moisture, plant, and, and let the soil do the work. Every, th every aspect of it is working to the benefit of our farm, the environment, and, 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 and our employees. The, the fact that, that every year we, as we get to our ground, the, gr the ground works better. We do not expect, if we see clods in a field, we feel that we've, we've blown it in some way. We want to keep that soil as healthy as possible. And by doing it, it's, it, 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 you get all the positive results that once you get to the act of planning and moving on, this is making us money. By spending the money, by going to the trouble of putting in the cover crops and, and working the ground carefully in the fall and setting the plate in the spring is an example we rarely ever use any type of pesticide on all this wide range of crops, on 1,700 acres, on a multitude of different crops, and we have very little disease problems, almost no insect problems. We definitely battle some weeds. We're trying to get better at it. Weeds is still our nemesis. Our fertility problems are almost next to nothing, or I would say nothing. Fertility is not even a factor. So. We're doing this because this farming method is in a sense, it gets simpler every year. It's not complex. It's sort of take care of the soil and then get out of the way. Let mother nature do the work that needs to be done. A farmer doesn't, I, from my perspective, a farmer does not need to stick his nose in every operation every day thinking that the crop can't grow without him. I find the crop grows very well if, as long as you set the plate. Right now, the shovel goes into the into the ground really easily. As you, you can see, it's it's absolutely loaded with roots and development, and also the structure of the soil. Uh, even this is heavy clay; it's still extremely friable and crumbly, and it's it's simply inundated with roots. So, like we feel these plants, where well, they are healthy and we think they're going to stay healthy. And uh, if we just took the soil probe, we, we can go three feet very easily with uh, no, no back pressure. The, the important thing is that in years past on clay ground, when we would sprinkle irrigate, as we're doing now, three to four hours was as long as we could run the water before water was standing in the field. And now we can run seven or eight hours and not have a drop standing. So we're going to run by a few fields that are a few different crops. And again, the idea is, of course, making a profit, but also trying to have a rotation that's very thoughtful and where one crop is helping the next crop and constantly delving into new crops. Right here we're driving by uh, lentils and uh, lentils could be a really good rotation for following rice because rice is extremely hard on the nutrients. Uh, next year the field's fairly empty. Just this field is uh, another one of our fields in the rotation like last year was corn, the year before that was beans, the year before that it was wheat. With uh, Other than the wheat, cover crops are interspersed every winter. And, uh, and so fertility wise, yeah, we're really happy with the evenness of it. Nothing's been put on this field 
since the fall of 2017. It's June now of 2018. We put compost on. We put some microbials and seaweed with the drench when we planted the tomatoes, and that's it. Nothing else has been put on this field. But uh, yeah, this is the goal, is pretty much getting the ground right, plant it, and get out of the way. Just we're, uh, we're coming up upon a, a rice field that's, that's very unique. Um, I think it's safe to say there's not another rice field in California like this rice field because it's being grown for a Japanese community that's very concerned about purity of food. So they pay extra um, to grow rice with zero inputs. This, this field has not had any other than cover crops for two years. And from my perspective, it looks as strong and healthy as any conventional rice field. I mean, it's, it's a nice looking <laughs> rice field for, I mean, that's all, I'm, I'm really proud of it. It's, it's special, you just don't, you don't, don't get that. And that's one of the things that drives us. We feel we can't, we can control the price some, but that might impact, just cost might impact. But if you're getting your soil and your land better every year, you're doing, you're positioning yourself the best chance for profit or the best chance to ride through hard times. That's, a, that's your best chance to manipulate your financial future. And, and if you don't feel your farm's getting better every year, you got to change something. The organic processing tomato production systems of John Diener and Scott Park are impressive in many ways. Over many years, they have both succeeded in taking care of the soil at their farms in ways that now allow them to achieve bountiful, high-quality levels of production.